So, students, you are all, you are the crop, the cream of the crop of the O levels, I understand. So, you must have been studying hard. That reminds me of a, of a story about a physics teacher who told his class, students, Isaac Newton, he sat under a tree and an apple fell out of his head, and behold, he discovered, uh, he discovered gravity. Isn't that wonderful? The student got up and said, yes, sir. Uh, but if Isaac Newton had been sitting at the desk and looking at these books like we are, he would, he would not have discovered anything. So, um, with that, as a bit of an introduction, um, I will tell you a little bit about monkeys. Now, you may not think, you may think that there's not much to be learned from monkeys, but I hope to uh, <coughs> uh, prove you otherwise, or at least show you otherwise. But All right, so I'm going to talk to you about primates and what we might learn from primates. Um, a basic premise uh, in these kinds of studies where we look at the behavior of animals and try to learn something from them um, is that here in our primate program we try to, our research's um, aim is to increase the knowledge about primates themselves and biology and in, in particular about the evolution of social behavior in primates and the relevance of that to man. Um, but that's a theoretical pursuit. It's an interesting kind of <coughs> um, activity. It has academic applications, but in a more practical sense, it also has applications to solutions to conservation problems, if you want to have a practical application. But it also has some medical applications, which I won't go into here. Um, the basic theoretical premise of all these kinds of studies is that we need to consider that all organisms, grasses, insects, mammals, fish, no matter what life form it is, are designed to perform one function only, and that is to survive long enough to reproduce. Actually, the individual organism isn't all that important. What's most important are the genes that encode or that developed or that designed the organism. So what lives from generation to generation are the genes that um, are developing and designing bodies. And uh, it's actually not the genes themselves, it's the copies of genes. And the copies is an interesting concept here because in, in any copy process there is, there is room for error. I mean, maybe 99.999% accurate, but even in biology, in genetics, there is always a chance of a bit of an error. And it, is, it are these <coughs> what we call mutations that are of interest to the evolutionary biologists. In a, in a, by way of these mutations, these changes in the genetic code, that we get improvements um, or not um, in, the, uh, in the design of, of an organism or of a, of a body. Now, uh, biologists refer to this idea of survival and reproduction as fitness. It's not the same as physiological fitness. And uh, get away about from this idea of you know, survival of the fittest I mean, that's a, that makes no sense. Fitness is survival. Uh, surviving is fitness. It's a, it does uh, get rid of this idea of uh, uh, that's sort of misquoted in, uh, so often. Um, so basically what we're saying is that everything about an organism, its anatomy, its behavior, its physiology, its you know, biochemistry, um, has been designed, has been honed through natural selection to serve the ultimate purpose of making copies of genes and making sure that they survive into the next generation. And the way that a gene, a DNA molecule, which is a gene, makes sure that it survives or copies of itself su survives is to design a body that is capable of surviving in a particular environment and of reproducing in a particular environment. Now, uh, social, uh, so, Social living, living in social groups, is also a trait that has been designed to uh, <clears throat> give an advantage uh, for survival and reproduction. Um, so some of the advantages of social living, group living, is it's easier to find food and to defend food against other competing animals in the forest. If you are a group of two or three or four or five, it's a lot easier for you to monopolize a fig tree uh, or a clump of termite mound uh, than if you were an individual. So living in a group in that sense has an advantage, a feeding advantage. You have the cooperation and the support of your social group members. Um, 
the downside of that is that you, within a group you also have to share. So we'll get to that later. Um, also, living in a group, you have an enhanced um, enhanced defense against predators. More eyes to, 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 to see predators and more of you to chase a predator away um, if one happens to be close by. Um, it's also easier to find a trustworthy mate. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm saying you're trustworthy because not all mates are all that trustworthy. So you have to be careful who you select to, to mate with, um, even for a monkey, and even for an amoeba, and even for a blade of grass, that's true. Uh, relatives and you, in a group also, the social group, you have relatives that help in raising the young. So these are all the benefits that, or, or some of the benefits, the main benefits that accrue if you're in, in a group. Now, the disadvantage of social living is that, number one, you have to compete with others in the group for food, for whatever <clears throat> limited food resources there are. And if you are a low-ranking animal, then of course you're out of luck. And the other risk is in breeding. Now, what's the big deal about inbreeding anyway? From a biological point of view, inbreeding is related to sexual reproduction. And you remember at the beginning I said that um, everything that we are, that any organism is, is encoded in the DNA molecule. And change in the DNA molecule, uh, mutations, um, are, uh, either improve the design of an organism or in most, in most, in most cases they actually uh, failed to make an improvement. Um, now, if a mutation occurred in an individual, in one individual, and it reproduces asexually, which means it divides itself and has offspring, and that all those offspring divide themselves and have more offspring, I think most of you know what asexual reproduction is, uh, then that <clears throat> new invention, that new improvement in design is confined to that one lineage. And if in that one lineage there happens to be a bad mutation, then whoop, the entire lineage is, moved, is wiped out, and that improvement in design is, is lost forever. Now, one way that parents can assure that their offspring benefit from any invention, any genetic improvement that has been in the population of the same species, is to exchange genes with other members of the same species. And that's what we refer to as sexual reproduction. Um, sexual reproduction is an exchange of information, uh, of DNA between, between members. And in that way, if there's a good invention, <coughs> an improvement in the genetic code for, for, uh, for a better design, a better an organism that's better able to survive and reproduce, then that is then shared. And parent parents reproduce in that way, reproduce sexually to give their offspring a benefit of a new invention that may be in the body of their mate or and mates ancestors. Now the problem with this is, is that there are also, like I said, in, in a genetic mutation, most of them are actually harmful. I mean, the vast majority actually cause harm, and it causes the organisms to die. But, and if they die, of course, that's the, that's the end of the problem, that's no moral problem. But sometimes they don't really, by themselves, they don't cause death. They have to be combined with another allele, with a second gene, another allele they call it, in order to have its effect. And we call these things the recessive genes. And in sexual reproduction, there's a huge amount, a huge store of recessive genes that are actually potentially harmful. So if two, if two of these genes come together, they, they come to full expression, and uh, the, the organism develops a bad trait, or and it might even die. So that's the that's the problem with uh, well, with, uh, with with uh, with these mutations, and the. The relevance of inbreeding here is that if an organism has recessive genes, and we all do have recessive genes that are harmful, all of us have, in our bodies have genes that could potentially kill us. Now, if you mate with close relatives that have the same recessive gene, then the probability of that gene coming to expression is increased markedly. So that's the, down, that's the downside of inbreeding. It's, there's nothing really wrong with, you know, mating with your sister or your mother or whoever else, except I mean, theoretically, this is, except that it ha it causes it, it it has this potential bad effect on on, on, the, on the offspring, and that and selection evolution has so weeded that out. So all behaviors and organisms are designed to prevent inbreeding. But I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here. So all right, the problem here is that macaques, monkeys live in societies. They're closed, and they're polygamous. Polygamous means a, a, a male will mate with many females, the female will mate with many males, for reasons that we won't go into, but it's a good strategy, and they mate year-round. 
And so they have many, many opportunities. Living in a closed group, I mean, monkeys live in groups of relatives. So they have many opportunities to mate with relatives. So here's a bit of a dilemma. Okay, it's an advantage to live with your family members because they help you in, in so many ways, it's, it's beneficial, but you can't mate with them because if you do, there is a, this risk of inbreed. And we just, I just showed you how bad that is. So how do monkey, how do, how, how do organisms cope, cope with that? Um, I've already, this slide just shows, basically it reiterates what, everything I've just said, that uh, mating between, between close relatives increases the probability of, of uh, recessive genes, bad recessive genes coming to expression. And you get in, what we call inbreeding depression, and we want to avoid that. So theory suggests, genetic theory suggests that inbreeding should be very rare, but is it? Uh, one way to measure that in a wild population of monkeys, or, or even in humans, is to take blood samples from a large sample and look at the genet and look at the genetics. And there are certain with, there are certain alleles that you look at, there are certain formulations that procedures that um, you can come up with. Um, in this particular sample that we looked at, we looked over at over a thousand monkeys uh, in, at Bonnaroo, and took, took their DNA and uh, uh, looked at the microsatellites. And this allowed us uh, to look to come up with an estimate of the degree of inbreeding in the population. We didn't know what it was. Estimates from other populations from ungulates, they said, well, there's about 10 or 20 percent of inbreeding in, in, in natural populations of animals, but these were all based on small sample sizes. Nobody really knew what the degree of inbreeding is in a natural population of mammals or of vertebrate animals, because nobody's really taken the trouble uh, and the cost to look at it. But we did at Puerto Rico. All right, and here's what we well, here is what we found. I don't know if you can see much of this. Okay, we looked at 1,113 animals. Okay, and we took at their, looked at their genetic makeup, and we found that a thousand, most of them, 1,680, had absolutely no, no, um, no inbreeding uh, at all. Uh, actually, only less than one percent of all animals, the ones that are very low here, 0.125, the ones that are marked in red at the bottom of the of this uh, table, showed inbreeding. All right. So what it's, what this suggests, what this shows. Uh, demonstrates very emphatically is that in a natural population of primates, less than 1% of them are actually inbred. But what's going on? Because these monkeys, they live in social groups, they're mating all the time, year-round opportunities, they have all these relatives around, plenty of the relatives, but it doesn't happen. Okay, now why does it not happen? Let's take a look. This is a slide that shows um, the age when males become uh, mature, <clears throat> no, actually it show, doesn't show that, it shows the number of offspring that males have sired, and that's the, the orange uh, bars. And then it shows, on the other side, on the left hand side, it shows the number of males that dispersed from their natal group um, uh, uh, at the age of, the, the number of males that <clears throat> uh, left their natal group forever uh, uh, after birth. Uh, after birth. In, a, in macaque society, the may females, they stay within the same social group for their entire life. They never leave. The mothers and the daughters and the grandmothers and the aunts, they all stay together. The sons and the nephews, they can stay around till about three or four years old, five years old, and then they leave. And they seek mating opportunities elsewhere. So what we show in this particular graph is that uh, the, I'll just go over here and show. This is the um, this is the age at which males leave their mother's group, right? And most of them leave before they're actually able to reproduce, which is right here. This orange shows. Do you need? Can everybody hear me? Do you need? 